All right, thanks. So up next is uh, Jim. Welcome. So thanks for uh, coming out tonight on such a rainy night. So it's the Great American Eclipse, Glendo, Wyoming, and related solar phenomena from Toronto. So now that I'm securely into my fifth decade of life, I've really come to appreciate the study of history. Um, I think knowing the past helps you know the future. So 140 years ago, there was another American eclipse that occurred in the summer and also viewable from Wyoming, specifically Rawlings, Wyoming. And there's some stunning parallels between 1878 and today. For example, both eclipses could be seen from Wyoming. The U.S. was um, just a decade removed from the Civil War, and today they're just a decade re removed from the Great Recession of 08. The White House was at an all-time low. <laughs> and the U.S. president won the election by winning the Electoral College, but not the popular vote. And of course, we have this. <laughs> There's a fairly low opinion of the U.S. worldwide, and the opinion of the U.S. is in decline today. And belief in science was low back then, it's still low today. Just to give you an example of how low the belief in science was back then. Sorry, I'm trying to get this guy to move forward there. There we go. This was a bestseller printed in 1873, Sex and edu Education, A Fair Chance for Girls, written by Dr. Edward Clark, MD. And it was so popular, there was a second printing in 1884. So Dr. Clark contends that the proliferation of female colleges and co-education is harmful for the, for the American women's health. Uh, he said that Higher education taxes the brain and causes the atrophy of a girl's body, especially her reproductive organs. <laughs> and I will quote this. This is not my words, his words. He said that higher education changes the character of a woman, eliminating all trace of maternal instinct and developing a personality of Amazonian coarseness and force. <laughs> this is, I'm, I'm, I'm very serious. This is what he wrote. Fortunately, history remembers the American expedition to this, to this eclipse as one of serious science. And in fact, none other than Thomas Edison was a member. Now, for those of you who are too young to know who Thomas Edison was, uh, he was the first celebrity inventor, and he was way bigger than Elon Musk is today. Um, this is also the first modern eclipse, because instead of having to struggle for months to get to the path of totality. Edison enjoyed Victorian comfort by taking a train from his home in New Jersey all the way to Rawlings on the newly finished Union Pacific Railway. Now, one of the science goals for the, for the expedition was to find the planet Vulcan. And to be clear, I'm not referring to the planet Vulcan orbiting 40 Eridanae. That's where Mr. Spock is born. I'm talking about the planet Vulcan that orbits inside the orbit of Mercury. And because it's so close to the sun, it can only be seen during a solar eclipse. So Mercury has a funny orbit. It's got this thing called a perihelion advance. And the perihelion is the position uh, that a, of the closest solar approach of a planet every time it orbits. And that's usually the same place, but for Mercury it changes. And so you get this series of translocated orbits each time it orbits the sun. And the best minds of the time reason that there must be another planet whose gravitational pull is causing this, this effect. And that was a pretty reasonable idea because that was how Neptune was discovered. Because Neptune was predicted mathematically as a body, a large body, outside of Uranus's orbit, which caused Uranus's um, orbital mechanics. But of course, Vulcan was never found because it doesn't exist. And in 1919, Einstein elegantly proved that Mercury's orbit can be predicted perfectly by general relativity. So this is what um, the eclipse in, seven, in 1878 looked like, uh, according to uh, drawn uh, diagrams or pictures there. Anyway, let's fast forward to 2017. So this is my expedition. Um, I flew into Denver on Friday night. I picked up my RV Saturday morning, 
And I got into Glendo in the evening. Because I was flying, I like to fly with take on, carry on luggage. I had to pack very light. So I just carried this um, Kenko Sky Memo, Sky Memo um, tracking mount, which I uh, polar aligned the night before. I've got my Olympus EM1 Mark II camera and a 500 millimeter reflex lens. So there are these um, reflex lenses are essentially castle green reflecting telescopes. And if you compare uh, one to a refractor type lens of, of the same focal length, these are both 500 millimeter focal length, you can see that these ones are far more compact and lightweight, perfect for airline travel and perfect for a low capacity tracking mount. Uh, just as a quick aside, a lot of photographers feel that these are inferior by design. Um, but I think everybody in this room will, will know that any Schmidt Castlegrain can see just as much as any refractor of the same size. So it's, it's not because of design. Typically, it's because they're, they're poorly made or, or um, of infer inferior quality or cheap. But if you buy one that's well made, it's just as good. So it takes about three and a half hours to drive north of Denver on Interstate 25 to Glendo, Wyoming. This is the scenery on the way. A lot of, um, a lot of uh, highway messaging warning you that it's illegal to stop on the side of the road to watch the eclipse, although I'm sure lots of people did, uh, reminding people to turn on their headlights during totality. So of course, the night skies are pristine in tiny Glendo, population 200. I think I took this on Saturday night. And a lot of people ask me, how dark does it get during, during the eclipse? So I took this time-lapse video. I'm not sure if I can get it to run. Oops. Can, yeah, can you, yeah, can you click the, with the mouse? Thank you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so this is a time-lapse that compresses about an hour and a half into two minutes. You can see the RV park is fairly empty because the owners unfortunately quadrupled the, the weekend rate during the eclipse, uh, whereas they could have sold out the whole thing if they had maybe had a more reasonable rate. There's my RV. I, I really enjoyed this RV. It's, um, it's a Mercedes Sprinter van, which a lot of tradespeople use as their, as their delivery van. Uh, handled very well. It has a diesel, so the economy was almost like a small car. And with a little coaxing, you can get it up to 140 kilometers per hour on the highway. Wyoming has a very uh, liberal speed limit. Um, I tried to convince my wife and son to come with me, but they only wanted to go for one day, which is not logistically possible. So I, I called my old friend who lives in New York City, and he brought his 12-year-old daughter and, and kept me company. So the, the idea of the RV was that in case the weather turned sour on Sunday night, I could drive to somewhere like Lincoln, Nebraska, not have to worry about food, not have to worry about finding a motel, and be very mobile as a result. But the weather, as you can see in the sky, was perfect, just pristine for the whole weekend. So we're probably getting close to half an hour from totality here. You'll see me taking the occasional photograph with a, a white light solar filter. I'm able to control my camera with my Android phone, um, so that way I don't, I don't have to touch the camera at all and, and disturb its, its very uh, fine alignment. So we're probably getting close to about 15 minutes out from totality right, right here. And by this point, you probably can't see it, but the, 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 the light of started turning kind of yellow. You, you know, you could, colors started to look a little different. No, that's just the time lapse effect. Yeah, it looks like it's very windy, but because of the, the, the because we're only taking one frame per second, it exaggerates the movement of the of the leaves. That's that's good observation. And we're almost there. We're gonna have uh, my friend's daughter visit us a couple more times, and then the, then the totality will occur. Yeah, and there we go. And we're back. 
<laughs> yeah, I, 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 I didn't look up very much. I must admit, <laughs> I was too busy concentrating on the camera because I, I, I was, I, I was, I was not going to leave that place without a decent photograph. So, so I must admit, I, I didn't, I didn't get the full effect of it. I, I'll have to save that for um, Niagara Lake. Okay, so I'll just go back to the next slide here. Yeah, so Glenda was another good place to see the to uh, the eclipse because totality occurred at lunchtime when the sun's at its zenith and. Um, as Chris was saying, that's that's when atmospheric seeing is the best way up there and best for for uh, imaging or, or photographing. And this is the picture I took. Um, I the camera shoots 18 frames per second, so I could take a lot of frames. I chose um, uh, exposures, uh, three exposures a quarter second, one one hundredth, and one four hundredth. Came home, I stacked them, stretched them, uh, did some uh, work with a radial filter, um, and then. Made a composite, so you get a sort of like a high dynamic range image of, of the corona of the sun there. So, because of the good weather, about half a million people drove in from Colorado to Wyoming, and they decided to all leave at the same time right after totality. <laughs> so this was a uh, this was the worst traffic jam I've ever been in my life. Uh, it took us between 12 and 15 hours to get back to Denver, bumper to bumper the whole way. Yeah, it was pretty bad. <laughs> and then just before I finish off here, I, I thought I'd take the opportunity to show you uh, kind of a related picture. This was taken on a Sunday in September. I think it's the first time this may have ever been captured or imaged because it's kind of a rare event. It's what I call a dual solar and lunar international space station transit. So at 8.20 in the morning, while the sun was just rising, I caught the space station flying across the sun. That's, that's this guy right here. And then an hour and a half later, I caught him flying across the setting moon. And that's over here. And I was also very lucky to catch this unknown satellite coming in at the same time, too. So I believe this may be the first time it's been ever done. I haven't, I haven't found anybody else who's ever seen this happen. And I was very lucky that it happened in Toronto, so I didn't have to go very far to get to actually get it, get it uh, accomplished. And like all good things, like the summer ending, that this is the end of my time up here. Thanks very much. Any questions? <laughs> Next up, we have Alan Kosuki giving his report on the eclipse. Alan, can you? Okay. Um, I observed uh, from a place in, in Oregon uh, called Madras, and uh, and uh, the group I was with, they, they wanted to start from uh, Vancouver. Uh, being Canadians and, and some of our party was from Vancouver and we wanted to get someplace within driving distance in there. So uh, basically we're looking at the west coast and uh, I guess let's see which okay which, which is the pointer okay oh, sorry okay ah okay so basically the the eclipse went down th this way I believe okay so the choice would have been either go down south down here. This is probably, okay, let me just, okay. So th there's Salem, that's where Ralph and his group went, and we decided to go to Madras. It's a little further inland, another mountain range, and, uh, you know, eventually we were heading a little further east from here, so it didn't matter to us that we were going a little bit further inland. Um, and as far as, being able to reach this, Portland has an international airport. So a short flight, if you were flying, was to go into Vancouver and then into, into Portland and then drive probably either this way or along this way and come into Madras. Um, Madras, unfortunately, has only two highways in. 
They are both uh, two lanes, one lane each direction. Okay, this one takes you through a park, and if you're and further south, you have California. So, knowing that it's a location which is hard to get into and get out of, the idea was that you were committed to getting in there early and probably not leaving the same day. Okay. Um, yeah. So the idea that, that we had with uh, Madras is there was a group that had uh, organized a solar festival. They were offering uh, camping accommodations basically from Thursday afternoon to Tuesday morning. And they, they promised that they would have activities during the weekend. All right. Okay. So th this is... Um, this is Mount Jefferson in the back. So we've got the mountain range here. This is Cascade Mountains. And the uh, camping areas were uh, marked off by using weed killer to, a farmer's field was planted with grass and then they killed the grass to mark off the sites for the camping. <laughs> uh, okay, the big brown ones are the expected uh, driving lanes and the green was supposed to be where you're to camp and they were officially giving you 20 by 20 feet. Okay, so the idea was that if you were camping and you got only one site, you were expected to put both your vehicle and your, your tent on that property. Um, and part of this facility is they had uh, uh, porta potties set up, they had, uh, okay. Now this is it's part of an overhead shot. This was captured from a, a YouTube video. Um, on Monday, early in the day, okay. Oops, sorry. Okay, so this in fact is the local airport. And so that, uh, you know, you had a lot of people that, that decided to fly in for the airport, for the Eclipse on their own private planes. And they also had uh, um, traffic jams of their, of their own when it came time to leave. Okay, so Basically, this is one of the highways that that go into town. Uh, the town of Madras is about 7,000 people. That's down this way. Uh, this group decided that they would have two main areas for uh, that they would host. This is out in the farmer's field, which had held the bulk of the people. Uh, and so, uh, okay, so that, that's part of the highway. This is looking a little further to the south. Okay, so the airport is out this way. This is the way into town. This is at an open area where they gave, uh, um, they had uh, balloon rides available. They had uh, food trucks around this perimeter. They had some entertainment. They had some, uh, okay, this is in fact the beer tent that they had there. Uh, so these are camping areas. Here's a set of porta potties. Here's a set of porta potties, and all of these are different people that have set up in the grid. Okay. Okay. Well. Okay. And this is looking towards the west, and at the extreme end, these are the RV parking. <coughs> uh, they gave RVs uh, twice as much length as they did for the campers. I'm sure they charge you more for it, but they gave them their own separate area. Uh, and this is a farmer's field, and the, this was the early morning irrigation that took place. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so basically the, this, is, they, they threw a big map on the wall, map of the world, and they asked people to put up pins as where they were from. And as you can tell, most people came from the West Coast. And uh, my brother comes from up here. So he had to, tr had to travel a day and a half just to get to here, just to get to Vancouver before, the, you know, driving in. But, okay. So among the activities that they promised is they, they held um, other camping and their events at the county fairgrounds in town. And they had an, uh, a music festival of sorts, and this is the main stage. Uh, they had uh, different lectures, uh, NASA had already committed to having uh, a presence 
in Madras. So they agreed that they would put on some impromptu um, lectures. And this, this was part of, you know, a covered eating area, and at the end of it, they had a stage, and, and they, they held talks, um, roughly one every hour for about six hours a day. Not on Monday, but uh, from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is a shot early on the morning of Eclipse Day, okay, with some of the clouds. There are high, thin clouds around. Okay. Uh, First contact was shortly after nine. So this is just an idea of looking around. If you didn't go down to the open area where the uh, balloon was, you could probably observe from your own campsite. But some people decided that sight lines being what they were, they, they wanted to be, you know, get a little more altitude. Okay. And this is during totality and the idea of the 360 sunset. Um, it's a quick handheld shot, and that's why it's kind of blurry, but uh, just to get an idea of what the sky would look like. Um, this is a capture by looking through uh, white field, uh, through binoculars on a tripod. And uh, I believe that was done with one of the iPhones in, in the group. Okay. And this is our group sort of relaxing after totality. Um, and a lot of people tried to, to leave almost after totality ended, and that's why this particular site is now empty, because they had tried to drive out. Um, our group had decided that uh, we wouldn't even bother trying to move on Monday. We'd wait till Tuesday. Okay. And this is, you've, you've, you've seen the uh, pinhole images, okay? Well, what we did is we took a fast food tray, a foam fast food tray, and took a pencil, and we poked holes in it, okay? Uh, so this was done very quickly, and, uh, you know, we decided that, oh, we need a good background to, 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 to demonstrate <laughs> this. So, so, so this is what, what was chosen, okay. Um, you know, so before the eclipse at the fairgrounds, NASA had a demonstration. They brought out a white light filtered uh, telescope. And it was, uh, you know, surprising to see a lot of people lining up to see different things, hear the lectures. And, uh, and it was good that you had some place to go uh, in your sort of downtime while you were waiting for things to happen. Okay. Uh, this was taken in the evening and uh, what had happened is this, these are not just clouds, that's wildfire smoke that had come up during that afternoon from the uh, southwest to the northeast, a big band all the way across, you know, almost 180 degrees, and that's part of the setting sun, or part of the sun coming down at that time. Uh, you know, there were lots, lots of different, uh, you know, YouTube video captures, um, this location, because it was a big campground, it was featured in all of the, the uh, US network TV coverage. Um, there's a number of things that were captured, but uh, I found that just by searching Madras, Oregon, Solar Town, or Eclipse, you could see all kinds of pictures. Um, I'm not a photographer, so I couldn't take any of these exciting dynamic pictures. Um, but, uh, our group was was uh, very much, you know, wanted to be there and observe. Uh, only one of the group had been to an eclipse before, and certainly he was uh, eagerly preparing his plans to go down to the eclipse for uh, at least four years before this year. Okay, um, but uh, yeah. Okay, well, and. And uh, that's it for, for my presentation. Just an idea that uh, uh, when you get out, um, this was a different event in, in terms of you're being out there with a lot of people who were committed to spending time waiting. Um, and, and what I found is that uh, at times you, you'd wander around 
I, I did this uh, because I couldn't sleep. Um, I wandered around the field and you listen to different people talking about different things. And some people were, were talking astronomy related things and other people were, uh, let's say, uh, alternative religious. Okay, let, let, let's call it that. Uh, but, uh, you know, at times you could you could pick who you wanted to talk to. You, you, you know, if you were sitting down talking to, you know, waiting in line or talking to people that, you know, you had different in interesting people that you could talk to or listen to. And uh, that was part of the experience too, is to go out and, uh, you know, look and listen and, uh, you know, and if you have a chance, maybe ask a few people, oh, how are you doing? Where are you from? And, you know, a, a lot of people can tell you interesting stories. And um, it, it's not just you getting to one place and then leaving, you know. If you're there, enjoy the experience. Okay, thanks. So thank you, Alan. So our last uh, Eclipse-related roundup talk of uh, the meeting is going to be uh, Tony Hervatin, and um, I'm the roadie. I'm the uh, I'm the guy that sets up the stage for the uh, the headliner to come and, and perform. So I'm going to give you a a bit of information, and then I'll pass it on to Tony. So our experience uh, came about because Ian went to Oskai uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, Ian Wilban and Katrina. Uh, in Slum went to Oskai and they met a gentleman astronomer from Colorado by the name of Greg Halleck and Greg said Greg, Greg, Greg got a ride from uh, from Ian and Katrina I think two are from probably two are from Sydney both all both ways so they, they got to know him really well and he became an honorary Canadian and by the time they were done that trip um, they had managed to uh, to get Greg to offer his best friends or one of his good friends um, vacation properties right on the path of totality of the eclipse. So this fellow wasn't an astronomer, but he owned a prime real estate just where we needed it to be. And so uh, a, 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 a trip was born uh, for about uh, 10 Toronto Center rascals to head down to Wyoming to see this eclipse. So um, the way it worked was that uh, Ian Wheelban and Blake Narrow and their their plastic mascot Imperator Pinka Rosa uh, hit the road with Ian's uh, Ian's camper, and he took with him uh, Phil Chow, his own uh, Ian's 20-inch Dobsonian, and Phil Chow's 15-inch um, Dobsonian telescope, and a couple of us also had smaller scopes and solar scopes and so on, sort of all packed in, jammed into his, Ian's trailer, and um, they drove overland and. Uh, the, T, the Toronto Center flyers in the list, Phil and Laura, and Grace and Tony, and Katrina, and Dan, Chris Vaughn, Chris uh, and Sue, uh, flew down to Denver and took rental vehicles um, to meet them. And where we were rendezvousing was at Merritt Reservoir. So Merritt Reservoir is the location of the Nebraska Star Party. It was supposed to be one of the darkest sites in the continental USA. And uh, we had planned three nights of observing at that location. And the first night we got there, it was a, a tremendous, all hell break loose, thunderstorm, where we feared for our lives driving through it. Um, but uh, so that night was out. The following night was, was looked like a good observing night, so we went off uh, away from the campsite, set up our big telescopes, and uh, fought off hordes of hungry mosquitoes, because um, we were the only warm-blooded things, I think, within uh, several hundred miles, and um, tried to get some observing in, but uh, we kept end up getting interrupted by vehicles coming into camp at the campsite. Every, every five, 10 minutes, there'd be a car with headlights driving by. So it was okay, but it wasn't great. Um, the next morning, dawn broke, and uh, the news started, news started to come up that there were 14-hour or tremendously ridiculous traffic jams in Oregon. And so the idea was sprouted, maybe we better go to Wyoming a day ahead, we, ahead, of, ahead of our plan. So we, uh, we loaded up the truck and left Nebraska a day early and went to our observing site, which is over here, where the stars are, in Glenda, Wyoming. So here's the track of the eclipse through Glenda, Wyoming. As you can see it's two minutes and 28 seconds of totality, and uh, this is where our friend Eric Olson had his vacation property. So Glenda, population 205, as Jim mentioned, 
uh, swelled to 250,000 for that day. And uh, most of the people were um, sort of corralled in the uh, airfield of the, um, the town um, airport and the adjacent state park where they had set up porta potties and places for people to camp. And uh, we were ensconced in this nice little uh, gated uh, property with about uh, eight or 10 sort of private homes nestled inside the state park. So we had a much more sort of much more elbow room where we were. But um, this is uh, one of the maps that they put up in town near the, um, the t-shirt shack where everybody put a pin where they're from. And, and you can see it's Denver, this is Denver. So we're up here, Glendo is somewhere up in here somewhere, yeah. Yeah, down in here, yeah, right about here. Well, just to give you a sort of a 3D perspective, and the aerial view is gonna come back into play in a couple minutes, as Tony will mention. But uh, this is where the place was. It's a lovely, uh, lovely large log home with some surrounding property. He had a big boathouse with a nice finished loft which we all moved into and thought, well, we're just gonna call this Toronto House. Canada. So, or Canada House. So, uh, sorry, typo, Canada House. And um, most, a lot of us stayed in there. A few people decided to set up tents. None of his property was very horizontal, so tenting wasn't very good, and there was a lot of sharp, sharp uh, pine, cones. pine cones and stones and things on the ground. But anyway, we, we made do, it was wonderful, it was wonderful. We were in a great place. So here's Glendo back here, and here's the, uh, the area where the, the uh, 250,000 people were all gathered up, <laughs> up here. So we were nice, nice, and, uh, nice and isolated. So uh, this is a picture of Greg, the honorary uh, Canadian who we met in Australia, or Ian met in Australia with Katrina. And this is our host, Eric, with his family, his father and daughters. And as you can see, uh, we brought some, some telescopes. So Eric invited about another 80 people to uh, hang out on his property. And so there was about, about 90 of us. Uh, all the comforts of home, running water, showers, uh, beer kegs, cooling on the deck, on the back deck. And, and uh, so we had a couple of nights of outreach uh, with completely drunk and uh, festive um, revelers uh, <laughs> looking through our giant telescopes. Yeah. I had one, uh, one guy who was about six foot four, looked like a surfer, uh, looked at Saturn and turned to me and said, I need a hug. <laughs> <laughs> and he, gave me, he gave me the warmest, the warmest embrace. He was so overwhelmed by seeing Saturn through this nice big telescope. So, so this is the observing field we had. You can see the, the big covers on the Dobsonian telescopes and then some of the solar telescopes are kind of set up here and there as well. Sort of morning, morning of the eclipse. So the morning dawn, beautiful as Jim mentioned, he was just down the road where the 250,000 people were in that sort of vicinity. Uh, we also had a news crew. So we had the Denver 9 news crew here uh, come on to, I, I guess they knew or heard of uh, this gathering and decided to come and, and stay, so they spent the night, actually spent two nights there, and they interviewed um, Eric in the morning, and they also, Phil got up early, so they interviewed Phil quite extensively in the morning, and, uh, and so on. So uh, part, of the, part of what we wanted to do was is some outreach while we were there, and um, these 80 people that were guests of Eric thought that he was so great to arrange to have all these experts on site. So uh, we were happy to do it. So we did the nighttime stargazing and then we did, um, uh, I did a, um, about a 15 or 20 minute sort of orientation session uh, about half an hour before the first contact, just to explain to people what to do with the glasses, when to put them on, when to take them off and so on. And also to remind them not to bother the imagers during totality. Um, <laughs> because the, nobody was going to be uh, busy with cameras is going to want to be you know, answering questions and, and distracted during that time. Me, not as, as not an imager, I, just, I said that I was well, you know, more than happy to have people stand near me and I would um, use this app, which was written by uh, or designed by Gordon Telefun, uh, which is the Eclipse Timer app, which was designed to load all the, uh, the circumstances of the eclipse and then audibly prompt you to do all the things you needed to do. Look for the horizon, Look for the shadow bands, look for the, uh, um, the 360 degree sunset and all the various things that happen during an eclipse. So it was great. And we would just shout out uh, commands to tell people to take their glasses off, put them on and so on. Uh, again, the uh, obligatory call into eclipse. Uh, Katrina, uh, the scientist as she is, she, her, her sort of uh, pet project during the, the whole exercise was to take uh, temperature measurements. So this is the, the data plotted up afterwards. Um, uh, Blake assembled it for her. And you can see that um, 
we haven't subtracted sort of the diurnal trend through the day, but it's about a seven degree uh, Celsius uh, drop. So that was great, another great um, outcome of the eclipse time. And that, you'll notice that there's a lag, there's a delay between the temperature and the minimum temperature. So here's our post-eclipse uh, post celebratory picture with all of our eclipse glasses. We took eclipse glasses to, to have to hand out with, to people, but uh, Eric had arranged, made arrangements to have some too, so everybody had all the equipment they needed and it was a great day. Um, out of the, we also had about 60 or so people from the neighbors that came sort of in our area, so out of the 150 odd people gathered for the eclipse, only one person had seen the eclipse, had seen a total eclipse before and that was Charles Darrow. So Charles Darrow and Sarah and their two boys were meant to be in Glendo with the throngs, and when they heard about the great digs we had, they decided to, to do a, a left turn at Albuquerque and join us. So, so here's, uh, here's Sarah Seeger and Charles Darrow uh, bringing us up to 12. So I'm gonna pass it over now to, uh, to Tony. Oh, and just, just once the, all the revelers went home and we got to do some serious astronomy, uh, we pulled out the ARP, Galax, or ARP Atlas and started looking at some, some ARP galaxies under this fantastic black, uh, dry uh, desert sky, so it was great. And then uh, Blake and Ian uh, took their, their road home again. So thanks, to, uh, thanks in advance to, uh, for pictures included here, Charles and Tony and Katrina and Eric. Uh, I put some in, Ian put some in, and, and Deepmar has done a lot of work for us. I'm sure uh, Tony will mention that as well. So I'll pass it over. Well, thank you very much, Chris. That was an excellent intro to uh, uh, our excellent odyssey in Glendo, uh, Wyoming. Um, I have to say right off the top, I, I really feel extremely fortunate to have been able to participate in that event. And it really is just through the kindness of uh, Eric Olson and, and, of course, the connection through uh, Greg Halleck and, and our own rascals, Ian and Katrina, that got us there. It was just a very fortunate uh, happenstance. Um, I guess before I get into what I want to say about the two videos I'm going to show, a couple other tidbits I'll just throw in there before I forget. Um, you may notice we're all wearing these, uh, all, all of us got these very excellent uh, Glendo, Wyoming t-shirts that were put out by the Park Service. And uh, we were very lucky to get those. We just traveled down into the park, uh, was it the morning of or the mor day before? Day, day before. And we got them and uh, so that, that was really cool. There was, it just seemed to me there was a lot of solidarity and just so much community in the group of us and, and all the people that were there. It was just such a wonderful event. Uh, I just uh, couldn't ask for a more sort of a warming three days than, than we were there. Um, so as I mentioned, um, it was really an ideal location and you'll see a little bit more of it now in the images that I'm going to show you. Uh, so Eric's house was really on the, on the brow of a hill. Uh, as Chris mentioned, it was a gated community, uh, perhaps a dozen homes, something of that nature all spread out. He had about an acre and a half to himself, but as, as uh, Chris mentioned, was quite rolling, lots of pine trees, so it was a bit uh, uh, challenging for putting a lot of tents on, but we were fortunately, we secured Canada House, and that worked out very well for us. Um, but it really was ideal to observe the eclipse because what I found, it, it changed everything for me in terms of how I was going to observe the eclipse because of the western vista. And because we were on the scarp of the hill, we were able to look out way into the distance to the, to the mountains in the west that were way beyond the plateau where we were, and you could see the western horizon. And we knew immediately we would see that shadow from a long way off before it was going to get to us. So most people actually went out onto the roadway of the community and stood on the scarp of the hill uh, to look to the west. So it, it was kind of like, you know, tripods were here, there, and everywhere, so a few things changed. But I, I do have to say, you know, all of us really prepared well in advance. We studied, we listened to great talks, Mike Watson's talk, for, for example, um, and we thought we were prepared, but I, for one, have to say I was not prepared for this. I was prepared technically and physically and what have you, but I was not prepared for what I was going to see. Uh, I have, I'd never seen a total solar eclipse before, as we heard Charles was the only one there who had, um, and it was very emotional for me, uh, I think. It was... Uh, we expected, you know, we were told what you're going to see, but when it actually happens, you're not ready for it. It, it really is it's quite an emotional uh, uh, time. Um, and you'll see that in the video. There's some giddiness and some silliness that comes out in the audio track. Um, it's, it's uh, well, it's the way it is, and it, it, nothing was scripted. You know, it's just the way it turned out. But when you're in a bright and hot, sunny noonday 
it was quite windy where we were on the hill. It was just a great hot Wyoming day, and it suddenly turns dark and sunset-like. That's kind of freaky. That's that was weird, and uh, it was excellent nonetheless. But it was just very very weird. Now, uh, in our public outreach events at Toronto Center, we often try to uh, you know put some scale or some meaning to what the public are looking at and what we're showing them. And one thing I like to do is I like to uh, try to illustrate the scale of things they're looking at. So um, an observer might be looking at Jupiter and you'd explain, well, okay, the light that you're seeing that's coming from Jupiter is actually reflected sunlight from the sun. And that light, once it leaves Jupiter, takes about 40 odd minutes to get to your eye. So there is a time delay, even at the speed of light, there's time for that light to get to you. And then it direct their attention to Vega high overhead. And that light's been traveling for 25 years because Vegas is 25 light years from where we are. And then I would say, well, if we gaze to the east now into the constellation of Andromeda, we look at the galaxy M31, that light left there 2.5 million years ago and has been traveling all that time. So when those photons come down through space and strike your ret and send an a signal to your brain, that light has been traveling for two and a half million years. And then you just see the light bulbs going, wow, wow, then they get it. So, you know, you try to look for these kind of eureka moments, but this total solar eclipse blew all of that out of the water. I, I'm just saying, I mean, just, it just doesn't, it doesn't match. You know, when there's real motion in the heavens and just, it was just, okay, enough said about all that business. Um, so the first video you're going to see is a streaming of the news item that was produced by the Channel 9 News in Denver. It's about two and a half minutes or so. And this news item, uh, just a little bit of background on it. Um, yeah, they were on site for the two days or so, but uh, once it was all packaged and edited, they did it all in Eric's house, and then they were going to transmit it over the internet back to the station. Well, do you think they could get bandwidth to do that? Mm, no, they, they struggled. They went to every house in the whole community to try to find enough bandwidth to squeak that transmission out to their station. They'd make the nine o'clock, the six o'clock news, and I believe they did, what, in about like 15 minutes to spare? or something like that, and it actually aired. So what you're seeing here is what they threw up on the air, like with 15 minutes. And it does uh, show a lot of us Toronto rascals doing our thing. Um, and it is used by permission of uh, Tegna Media. The second video, I have to say, um, I really have to thank Dietmar Kupke. Uh, I think he's produced a wonderful collage. It's a five minute uh, movie. Uh, and it's blending many, many different sources. So we, we gave him a bunch of things to work with. There are still frames uh, by Ian Wheelband of uh, uh, images on the site, as well as all of the telescopic solar images. Um, there is an all-sky camera view, which uh, Charles Darrow provided. And uh, interestingly enough, you heard about the hot air balloons. Well, there were two hot air balloons that were launched uh, in the Glendo area and drifted in front of all of those folks that were down in the airfield. Um, and and uh, it happened, and they actually show up in my video that you'll see now. But it so happened that when I was surfing the internet looking for Glendo Eclipse video, I found the video that was shot from those balloons. So you can see, and a segment is put in the, in the video as well, you can see what the eclipse looked like at altitude. You can see the sunset. Uh, around the entire horizon. And you can even get a glimpse of where we were on the ground. If you remember Chris's graphic that he put up uh, that showed sort of the two fingers of the reservoir to one side and the major tongue of the reservoir to the right were sort of that area in the middle where people's flashes were going off on their smartphones on the ground. So you can actually see that. And a big, I have to put a shout out to Patrick Cloyd who was the uh, operator, the pilot of that balloon. And uh, thank you very much, Patrick, if you're watching tonight, because we did send you the link anyway. And thank you for letting us use your video in, in our presentation tonight. And along with all of that too, there is some footage and some stills from uh, an HD action camera that I used. I just set up on the site on a tripod. So some of that stuff is spliced in as well. And one of the things actually I'm very proud of that I didn't really plan much to get from it, but I also set up uh, a dash camera, which I have at that time hadn't been installed in my car yet, uh, but it's an HD dash camera and it was outfitted with a circular polarizing lens. And I thought, well, it might be interesting to see what happened. And that you will see is the images that show the, uh, uh, the transition from the partial into total and then going from total back out to partial. So that's the, when you see that, uh, the sort of the 
it's about a 160 degree view with the uh, total solar image. That's the uh, dash camera that's doing that. Now, someone asked me in advance, they thought, well, aren't you worried about letting your camera stare at the sun for like an hour? Before? And I said, well, normally I would, but I thought, this is a dash camera. Don't you drive into the sun? So, you know, we'll see what happens, right? If you kill it, you kill it. But I didn't, I didn't think it would be a problem. But uh, it all turned out quite fine in the end anyway. Um, and then, last but not least, um, all overlaid on this video was uh, a last-minute thought. I simply used my uh, Samsung smartphone and I just did a handheld video. And it's a little shaky, but I don't think we could reproduce uh, you know, the, what it shows. And you'll see which are the shaky parts. But uh, So I, I really have to thank Dietmar as a magician, put it all together. And uh, I hope you enjoy it, so just sit back, relax, and I'll ask Andrew then, if he doesn't mind, if you, if you wouldn't mind queuing up first, please, the uh, Denver News 9 video, and you can start that at your convenience. And uh, so when we come back, then we'll just take questions, and I guess then we're, we're good. All right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. The sky is over, but it's still fresh on people's minds. It's not every day that people cheer and shed tears at the sight of the sun. Of course, today was much different. Thousands came to small town of Glenda, Wyoming to see the total solar eclipse in the path of totality. 90s reporter Noel Brennan and photojournalist Ann Herps were there. <laughs> Today is better than we've seen in a while. The day is finally here. So. A pretty start to a summer day is pretty special when you've been waiting for this day. And so, 47 years. For about as long as you can remember. 1970, I was like 10 years old. After seeing like a 97% eclipse then, I started looking for a total that I could see. And this was the first one. Greg Halleck. Well, there you go. <laughs> focuses on details of the sun. You can see sunspots. While his friend Eric Olson <laughs> okay. scratches the surface. You should always wear as high as SPF as you possibly can, really. <laughs> Years ago, Greg convinced Eric. I'm the guy, yeah. To turn his home in Glendale, Wyoming into a campground. If I can get anything for you, let me know. On August 21st, 2017. That was back in 2014, and I thought, what are you saying? Now he's learning so much. So we counted 89 people. From so many willing to teach. We're going to see the sun's corona around the sun. There's a little eruption. You know, what I'm seeing right now, this very second, left the sun eight minutes ago. Among the masses camped out in Eric's front yard. Guinness Book of uh, Glendo Records or something. <laughs> is a team of astronomers who traveled thousands of kilometers. We am in Canada, so we're, we're metric. <laughs> to see the solar eclipse at the center of the path of totality. Yeah, thank you for the, arranging oh. for the moon to go in front of the <laughs> sun. It's my pleasure. <laughs> Eric is the gracious host, but Mother Nature was just as accommodating. Should be about one minute before we start seeing stuff. It's almost like a crescent moon that you'd see in the middle of the night. The sun's looking pretty much like a banana. When the star came out, <laughs> she shined. Oh, diamond ring. Oh, no glasses, you don't need glasses. For Greg, you can see the star next to the moon. It was worth the travel and worth the wait. And you can see all the streamers coming yeah. off, and that is just gorgeous. A pretty start to a day <laughs> that only got better. Oh, that was amazing. Noel Brennan, Nine News. <sighs> Amazing the difference of 8% makes. We were at 92%, they were at 100%, and that's insane. So beautiful. Well, good. Shadow's coming. The far horizon is getting dark. Oh no. <laughs> oh, jeepers.
Yeah, look at the sunset to the west. Sunset to the west. Oh, look at the sky. Look it up in wow. the Wow. Look at Venus now. Thank you so much, Eric. Questions, if you like. How old did you think Glenda was organized? Because I was there on the Wednesday before the eclipse, and it didn't seem to be. We went into the town center and asked them about the camping accommodations and what they knew about full versus available spots. And they didn't seem to have a clue compared to Jackson, which had hour by hour updates of which places were full and which places had space. Well, we weren't completely isolated. We didn't. We weren't dependent on Glendo at all because we had this sort of separate enclave. But Jim might be able to comment. 
Yeah, I don't think we were organized at all. In fact, we were routed by the police out of town as quickly as possible. They routed us north for five hours. So it took us five hours to get back to Glendale. So they didn't really care about where we were going. They just wanted out of, out of town. So it was very badly organized, for sure. Yeah, because yeah, I don't want to go Wednesday. Verizon was called and canceled the operating the town. Yeah, out. The cellular on the other side also canceled out on that. It went to Catholic. And they were unhappy about that. But again, yeah, I think it was lack of. You know, well, our, service yeah. our experience with all the services were really definitely taxed because a town that's normally 200 and you drop what, you know, whatever's there. There's no way the facilities are going to be handled. The cell service was crushed for the whole day, really. It was t you couldn't get on the system. Um, and as we mentioned about the crew trying to uh, send the uh, stuff back to the newsroom, just, just by late in the day, they finally got it squeaked out. Anyone else? No? Okay, well, thank you very much for watching, folks. Thank you.